Hey guys, it's a Rancast short. For those of you that don't know, I'm not an egomaniac. The Rancast is our spin on the Premier Pro Wrestling podcast. It's a joke, okay? Uh, since the hot topic right now is Chris Candido, because of the dark side of the ring of Chris Candido, which I haven't seen yet, I'm going to go ahead and talk about Chris Candido as somebody that knew Chris Candido and somebody that worked with Chris Candido for WWE. Now remember, I'm going to get there. I'm going to do more than one part. This is just the first part to kind of set the stage for you guys, things that you don't know or didn't know. You know, even guys that uh, knew Chris might not know this stuff at the time. But yes, uh, <clears throat> I worked one of the first Raws. I was handpicked to work with Tom Pritchard and Chris, managed by Sonny. Uh, when they were the body Donnas, and we're going to get to that. So, Chris was trained by Larry Sharp. East Coast wrestlers, it was kind of a weird click, and I'm not talking about by, by any other standards then. What I knew from being in Memphis full-time and what I knew being at the Sportatorium Dallas full-time, they looked at the East Coast as kind of a weird kind of place, you know. Uh, there were guys out there were typically trained by Larry Sharp or they were trained by uh, Johnny Rods. Chris was trained by Sharp. Chris was really, really small by industry standards. I am another really, really small guy from then by industry standards, but I was at least six foot and change. So the East Coast guys were looked out for by certain guys in the industry that weren't wrestlers. There were guys around the industry that paid their dues in other ways. They loved the wrestling business and they couldn't offer in-ring to the guys, but they could offer direction and they were respected in the territories and by a lot of talent because of their love for the industry and the dues that they paid in other ways and typically it was by doing favors, helping people out, being there, being a, support, a, a, a source of support, and not always being a financial support, but being like sometimes, more importantly, an emotional support. I did not know Dennis Coraluso, but Dennis Coraluso, guys like that, like Eddie Schumann, and even Kerry Silken, they love the wrestling industry, and they paid their dues. And paying their dues, they earned a certain type of respect. And Coraluzzo stepped up and tried to look out for Chris Candido. There was something about Candido that told Coraluzzo he's a stand-up guy, and I'm going to try to help and guide him and direct him. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? I first heard the name Chris Candido when I was down and finally had my sea legs in the Memphis Territory. And I'm not going to go into names because I don't want my words to be twisted and this stuff tied back to somebody else and create a problem for me where there isn't a problem. So listen to what I'm saying, not what you think I'm saying, okay? <sighs> Coraluso was checking in with one of the guys that I was down there with from the East Coast, okay? Uh, in wrestling then was a very different time. It was still a secret society. You kayfabed and you had respect for the business. When you went into a territory, it was like walking into these guys' homes. You don't go down there like yourself yet. You've got to get your lay of the land. Anything you can, anything you say can and will be used against you, okay? The reason for that isn't because people were assholes. It's because this is how they ate. They thoroughly believed because they'd been working for so long that kayfabe and not just kayfabe with the fans. There's a lot of things in terms to kayfabe. You guys think you know what kayfabe means. You don't, and you won't fully understand it, but this will help you kind of understand it. So, kayfabe would mean things like this. Chris's brother, you know, I think, talks about it in this dark side of the ring about Chris's love for the industry and how desperate he was to get into it and how he went ahead and he really pushed and pushed and pushed and kind of took backyard wrestling to a whole nother level. Now, today you see that, and I would see that as somebody that really loved the industry. Well, back then, 
the secret society states somebody like that should be nowhere in or near this situation. And if they had a chance to teach him a lesson, which meant an ass whooping, they would teach him that. It wasn't easy to get into wrestling. It wasn't easy to get into a territory. It wasn't easy to work every night. And you had to work every night to learn the industry. You got into the business typically in your 20s. It took you 10 years to master the industry. Your next 10 years from 30 to 40 was your money making years because now you knew what you were doing. Your body had filled out. You were supposedly hoping that you would have the emotional sobriety for, I mean, emotional stability for a company to get behind and push at this point, okay? Poor Chris died before he even got to that point, which is sad to me. Um, but when I first heard about Chris, sadly, what I heard about was this Mark kid from the East Coast whose girlfriend fucks all the boys, okay? That's how Chris was known in the Memphis Territory at the time, and that was very, very sad. Now, I'll say it again, and I've said it before. You can go back and check. I in no way, shape, or form approve of the burying of Tammy Sitch, who later became Sonny. Matter of fact, I would rather look at the good in regards to Sonny than Tammy Sitch's stuff and Tammy Sitch's law, you know, breaking and her legal career and all that shit that everybody seems to get off on. And sadly, even Jim Cornette is very entertained by it. I'm not. I think it's sick and I think it's sad. Mental illness and addiction are diseases, folks. And Tammy's promiscuity preceded Chris and that did not help him in the industry anywhere, especially in Memphis where he finally ended up for a short time, okay? So he comes in there with this reputation. They thought of him as a mark. At the time, Memphis's business was really down. They were still paying the way wrestling always paid, 33 and a third percent toward the building and the advertising, 33 and a third percent to the boys, 33 and a third percent to the company, okay? So they couldn't afford to take anybody in or get any big names in or anybody known in, which forced the USWA to try to go ahead and make those ditch efforts and stay open with younger green talent that could they could listen that could listen that they could mold into something. And the first guys on that list were the big guys, and you could look at the history of what built the Memphis Territory other than Andy Kaufman. The building of that territory and the personas were Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee taking on monsters. You see what I'm saying? So I've seen them myself go through a dozen big guys that had great looks that couldn't wrestle, but more importantly, they couldn't admit that they couldn't wrestle. They didn't have the attitude for it, and they couldn't be worked with, okay? That being said, small guys like myself and Chris Candido were at the back of the line. Now, I went down there for a three-day trial in Memphis, and I ended up not going home for nine months and working eight times a week, okay? That's what Chris wanted to do. That's what Coraluzzo wanted for Chris. And the things that I told you, including, you know, going back to his size, were the things that kept him down when the Memphis Territory was running full time. So I ended up doing this. I ended up throwing all these big guys against the wall to see what would stick. Do you understand what I'm saying? And some of those guys, for example, ended up being guys like The Undertaker, just off the top of my head, okay? So Chris had all this stuff working against him. You know, they've always said it back then, and I don't know if they say it anymore or even holds true anymore with the Internet, but telephone, tell a wrestler, you know, um, Anything leaks out from the East Coast, the Memphis, Tennessee area. I don't know how that would happen, but that's what Chris was saddled with. Now, I will not, again, bury Tammy. If Tammy was promiscuous, if Tammy is an addict or alcoholic, there's reasons for that. It's not funny. It's not here to entertain us. It's actually very fucking sad. And I'm going to go ahead and say anybody that laughs at that stuff, well, you're going to have to deal with your conscience at some point. You know what I'm saying? I'm not blaming Tammy for that. I'm saying that it was a sad situation, and he obviously loved the girl because he was still affiliated with her, all that stuff, and I'm sure Chris had his issues that went along with that, but at the end of the day, it's supposed to be a business, and sadly, at that time, like I says, with the Iron Curtain and the Secret Society and the real meanings of kayfabe, these just were not good for him. 
So they did finally end up bringing Chris in two years later, maybe three years later, in 1991. And God bless Chris for having the heart to go ahead and go down there because they were only wrestling three times a week, three house shows a week, plus Memphis TV, and they were only paying $30 a night. So that being said, that was not enough to live on. I don't know how he supported himself to go ahead and try to learn that stuff. He'd already probably been in the business three to four years, and he was still going down there basically paying to try to work and learn. All the good talent was gone because they couldn't afford him anymore. So do you see what I'm saying? And then what would happen at the end of that is during that time when I would call in to see how things were, they was told that it's just a bunch of marks down here that'll work for $30 a night, three or four days a week. Now, these things to me, I am in no way, shape, or form burying Chris Candido. I'm on the opposite of it. See, I'm kind of a tweener. I'll go ahead and call myself one of the youngest old-timers in the industry because I am part of that last full-time crew. When I say full-time crew, I'm talking about working every night of the week and again twice on Saturdays because we had live television to do. So I'm going to get to it in one of these parts soon, how and uh, behind the scenes stuff with being there at one of the first live Raws, which was a big deal. You guys take for granted today, live TV, live Raw. Vince McMahon is a controller. Vince McMahon is good at what he does. Vince McMahon wants everything to be as properly prepared as possible. So when he went live with Raw, this was a big deal, not to be taken for granted. And at the time, it was also a big deal for the fans, you know. Uh, right now, there's so much wrestling on TV, and there's so much live wrestling on TV that people don't take, or they take this for granted. They don't see it for what it is because we're numb to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? The other thing I want to say is this. The common belief is that uh, World Wrestling Federation and Vince McMahon killed off the territories. That's not the full truth to that, Okay. In addition to having problems with the talent and not grooming the talent to where you could draw money with recognizable talent or have to be able to afford talent enough to carry a young green Chris Candido and make him a star, the other thing that the territories, and I'm talking about especially the USWA, didn't do is groom your next level guys for promotion, to groom your next level guys that helped with creative. And I'm not talking about bookers. Yes, I guess I am talking about bookers because they couldn't afford a decent booker at the time either. But uh, they couldn't afford the assistant booker, which does all the grunt work. And I'm talking about one in particular off the top of my head. Eddie Marlin, you see? The other thing is you'll notice in the history of World Wrestling Entertainment, which World Wrestling Federation, which became World Wrestling Entertainment, is they knew how to optimize. It started with, like I says, whenever Vince would get in financial trouble and losing money due to, let's say, competition, which was a little bit of competition with the house show revenue in regards to WCW, what would Vince do? He would go and run the smaller, cheaper markets and venues, you see? When's the last time WWE ran Oshkosh, Wisconsin, for example? That's one of the buildings he would go to, and that's when he would particularly go ahead and do the foreign tours, i.e. Europe. It was a lot of more money to go and run in foreign countries versus there was a lot more money coming in from these markets that he didn't regularly play. In the business world, this is called optimizings, optimizing. And in the wrestling industry at the time, these promoters did not have the brain power to optimize because they saw that as some sort of step down which is basically ego-driven. Yes, Vince has a big ego, but Vince's ego is not too big to optimize like he did, for example, during COVID to keep his operations going and running crowdless. And if you look at the, 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 the value you know, of the WWE stock at the time, that's optimizing, you see? And I'm not comparing apples to oranges. I'm saying that some of the territories might have stayed open a little longer. Some of them might even be open today if they could have had their Eddie Marlins and the guys that did the extra work, like Guy Coffee, the guys that would go into the grassroots promoting and the guys that would supervise the grassroots promoting and running the smaller venues. When USWA was not drawing 
that television was still strong. Only thing is, they didn't know how to sell sponsorships and they were entitled to sponsorships, you see? Eddie was too old, Jerry was too busy, the egos were too big to go out there and go ahead and sell sponsorship and do the things that WWE does to stay open. Now again, stick with me because I'm going to get with you guys about a couple of things eventually. Uh, The truth behind TNA and I'm not going to go ahead and call them responsible for Candido's death, but they certainly didn't help. And also, when I worked with uh, he and Tom Pritchard and Tammy Sitch when they were the body donnas. All right, guys, please like and subscribe. And you can see in there, uh, in the description, where you can support Premier Pro Wrestling. I'm Randy Ritchie.